Hello, I'm Katrina Fox, and I'm joined today by Philip Wallen, the former Vice President of Citibank and the founder of the Winsome Constance Kindness Trust, a philanthropic organisation that provides venture capital for good causes in relation to people, animals, planet. Phil, lovely to speak with you today. Likewise, thank you. You've had such a a drastic change of lifestyle. Um, You started out in the corporate world um, as a former vice president of Citibank. You're a high-flying executive, and now you've become a philanthropist. So let's talk about a little bit about those days at Citibank. What was your life like then? Well, there were exciting times. It was um, in the 80s, largely. And at the time, after 10 years of heated debate, uh, we were finally given a banking license. So we were exposed to um, the big wide world of international banking and uh, it exposed Australia uh, to competition for the first time in the banking services industry. Uh, The beautiful part about it was that we were able to bring in international bankers of the highest standard. So competition increased, uh, the range of products increased types of services went through the roof and we were legitimately able to tell all our multinational clients at Citibank that it didn't matter where in the world your subsidiaries operated, we would make sure that the best account manager would be put face to face against your subsidiary. And that account manager could be a person from the United States, England, Spain, uh, Germany, India. Um, We would guarantee the best man for the job would be face-to-face with your local operations. So it was an exciting time. Um, I often used to joke that um, the chairman gave me a bonus every year without even knowing it. He <laughs> gave me a keys to the building and I could be in there any time of the day or night, or even on weekends. So it was a, a heady time and uh, in many ways I, I miss those days greatly. Okay. So in terms of the corporate world today, because you mentioned this was back in the 80s uh, when you were um, at Citibank, so I'm just curious to get your take on how you perceive the corporate world today, almost pretty much 30 years on in terms of sustainability, ethics, uh, influence on our society. Yes, yeah, so I've been thinking about um, those issues uh, in some depth recently. Um, just consider some of the companies today who've got the most powerful brands the most respected organizations that come to mind. Companies like, for example, Alcoa, uh, the Australian Reserve Bank, BHP, the Commonwealth Bank, Exxon, General Electric, Singapore Airlines, Kodak, IBM, the Australian Wheat Board, Lockheed, Qantas. All of them with powerful brand names, instant recognition. But what else do they have in common? They've all committed massive offences. I stopped counting these penalties when I got past one trillion dollars. So these are companies that have the creme de la creme running them. So um, the world has changed. Um, Our sense of ethics, decency, fair play has been diluted or subverted to a large degree. And um, when you ask about sustainability, I I think it's a rather um, odd word. It's a word that's sort of bandied around quite a lot. But what does it actually mean? Is the company sustainable? Uh, What about the product line? Is that sustainable? Is the industry sustainable? What about our basic economic system? Is that sustainable? What about the markets that we serve? Are they sustainable? What about the environment, the physical environment in which we live? Is that sustainable? Uh, So let's just remember that um, the notion of entropy really does exist. We live in a state of constant non-linear change. I remember in the 70s reading a book by Donald Sean called um, Beyond Beyond the Stable State, as I recall. And I recommend everyone should read a wonderful book by James Gleick called Chaos. And he uses as a metaphor a butterfly flapping her wings in the Amazon jungle and affecting um, hurricanes in Nebraska, typhoons in the South China Sea, and famines in the Sahara. Mm. And uh, another exquisite way of expressing it comes from one of my heroes, uh, Sir Martin Rees, who is now called the Astronomer Royale in the UK. And he describes that we are products of four billion years 
of Darwinian selection. And let's face it, we are not the ultimate culmination of this process, we human beings. We are not the end product. As you know, the, the sun is less than halfway through her lifespan, her life cycle. She's, half, she's reaching middle age. Um, so, it, and she will die. She'll turn into a red dwarf. So the creatures who observe her demise on that fateful day will be as different from us as we are from microbes or bacteria. So what is sustainable? In effect, bluntly and unpleasantly for all of us, nothing is sustainable. The issue, therefore, is how do we make the most of what we've got in the gentlest possible way, the most efficient, the most compassionate, and the most meaningful. And that, I think, is the ultimate way of looking at how we run our enterprises, how we behave in our homes, and how we treat each other. How, can you give an example of that? So how could a, a corporation, because you've mentioned those corporations that are not doing so well in those kind of terms. Um, can you give some, maybe one or two examples, practical examples of how um, enterprises can do that? Well, many uh, enterprises are now measuring themselves differently. What, let's look at it this way, like one of the things we discussed earlier was what needs to change. And uh, the most important thing, in my judgment, that needs to change is our system of metrics. Um, how do we measure things? Um, now, we all know as managers that you cannot manage what you cannot measure. Mm. You need to be able to measure. And we're a measuring species. It's part of our uh, the reasons why we've uh, triumphed uh, during this evolutionary cycle. So, the issue is, what do we measure? And therefore, we have to ask the question, how do we actually measure it? Mm. And basically, we also have to ask, when do we measure it? That is, that is it. Do we measure it now, or next month, or next quarter, or at the end of the year? Or do we measure it over a long time? life cycle. Now, all these measurements must take account of the externalities that affect all the stakeholders, not just the shareholders, but all the stakeholders in this complex enchanted web. And not just the stakeholders today, but the stakeholders of tomorrow. They have a seat at the table too, they're just not here at the moment. So I think the, the enlightened company, the enlightened proprietor, owner, the enlightened CEO, the enlightened chairman, takes into account this complex matrix in making all these decisions. So I would say um, there are some companies that are taking this, um, this type of thinking further, but we are nowhere near where we ought to be. And sadly, we are running out of time. We don't have time for this to be an intergenerational issue. It has to be started and made effective immediately. Well, I know you're very influential in, uh, in, in this because you, as you say, you've, become, you've gone from being this high-flying corporate executive to now uh, being a philanthropist. So I'd like to just touch on what was your epiphany because it's such a radical change. Um, was it one thing that happened? Was it a number of things that led up to it? Can you just talk a little bit about what created that change in you? Certainly. Uh, if there was a Damascene moment for me, I'd say it was when I went out as part of my job as a merchant banker to a client's operations and they happened to own a slaughterhouse. And what I saw that day absolutely terrified me. It affected me so profoundly, I've never been the same since. Um, you see, I, I heard the screams of my dying father as his body was ravaged by the many cancers that killed him. And I realized I'd heard those screams before. In that slaughterhouse, on the cattle ships to the Middle East, and a dying mother whale as a harpoon explodes in her brain as she calls out to her calf. Their cries were the cries of my father. And I realized that those screams were identical. And I concluded that in their capacity to suffer, a dog, is a pig, is a bear, is a boy. And that is when I became a vegetarian. But I didn't actually know enough 
to take it to the next logical step until I went to India and I saw a dairyman drag his cow, which had been badly injured in the lorry accident. Her spine had been broken and he dragged her to the gates of the slaughterhouse alongside her starving, bedraggled little calf. And before we handed her over to the butcher, the bastard milked her. Now, if that doesn't change the heart of a man, nothing will. As a consequence of that experience, I became a vegan. So if there is such an epiphany, I'd say those events are the ones that contributed most to who I am today. How did that change your life? Because I'm curious, you had this epiphany and then you essentially gave up the corporate world and became a philanthropist and I know your mission is to give all your money away and, and die broke which is a very noble objective. I'm just curious do you think you could have done, done things differently if you'd have stayed in the corporate world like stayed with Citibank? Do you think you would have been able to influence? I guess what I'm trying to get at is, is can people stay within the corporate world and make these differences if they have these epiphanies or do they have to leave? In my case I think I've reached a stage when I really wanted to um, branch out into doing something completely different. I read a book by a man named Burford called Second Half, and uh, the way he described it was quite interesting. He said, in the first half of your life, you're entitled to try to be successful. But in the second half of your life, you should try to be significant. And I figured by my late 30s that I was approaching the second half of my life and I wanted to do something significant. So that, that affected my decision. But now that I'm a lot older and wiser, I hope, I've realized that Burford was wrong. You don't actually have to wait for the second half. Why not do something significant now? Mm-hmm. So I think, uh, uh, was it Shelley who said, ah, but there lies the subtlest reason to do all the right things for all the wrong reasons. <laughs> I made the right decision, perhaps for reasons that don't apply today. But I, in retrospect, um, I made the right decision because I left with, uh, with my energy intact. Um, I had time on my hands, and that gave me time and uh, resources to actually study the issue. So now, almost 30 years later, I actually do know what I'm talking about. Whereas I think uh, if I had been distracted by staying within the corporate world, I would have had um, a foot in both camps. And in many respects, I would have been sitting on the fence. And I've discovered since then that sitting on the fence is for cowards and crows. Um, I don't believe that we have any choice any longer. Well, certainly I didn't. I've learned that uh, jumping a chasm in two leaps is not a very good idea. So you, you've you been doing a lot of this philanthropic work for many years. You've been Australian of the Year. Uh, you've got the Order of Australia Medal. But you really kind of came into the public eye in a big way. I guess you almost came out of the animal rights closet, we might say, when you did your talk at the St. James Ethics and Wheeler Centre on Should Animals Be Off the Menu? And it was a 10-minute speech, but it was so powerful, and it's been shared virally. I think probably about half a million, I think, hits that, that I'd seen when I last checked recently. What was the sort of impact and reaction to that? I know you got a big reaction from animal rights activists, but I'm kind of curious, what reaction did you get from business and the corporate world? Right. Well, it was funny how it all turned out, because um, around about that time, uh, Rupert Murdoch's press described me as reclusive. And uh, I didn't agree with it at the time, but now that I've had time to reflect upon it, they were correct. It was truthful. I was a recluse, and when they asked me to take part in this debate, I said yes without really thinking deeply about it. And as you say, it it did go viral, and I I understand it's now had two million people see it, and um, uh, it's been translated independently by private people into 20-odd languages. So in in a sense, it it was a sort of cathartic experience for me, and uh, something quite new. Now, the responses I've been getting have been completely unexpected, I have to admit. Um, No day goes by when I don't get half a dozen emails 
or messages on Facebook of people mm -hmm. saying they've decided to go become vegetarian or go vegan or do something like that or want to set up a new NGO. Mm -hmm. So uh, it has had an effect. And uh, I have to admit that before that debate, um, many of my old friends in the corporate world thought I was being quite eccentric. Um, they don't think that anymore. Really? Yes. Well, because, the, the, because it's been seen by so many people? Well, I think they saw me in a new light. And the debate, uh, when I, when my piece of the debate focused entirely on fact. Irrefutable, hard-hitting fact. Um, it, I had to be unassailable. Now, in the past, as I said, people 20 years ago, people thought I was eccentric. And 10 years ago, they thought, okay, he's not eccentric, but let's argue with him. But now there's so many facts out there that all the things I said 20 years ago are rather mundane. Everybody knows it. So people who reject what I'm saying are either astonishingly ignorant or deliberately obtuse. I'm not saying anything that is um, outlandish. Mm -hmm. So the only issues that emerge for me now is that people who refuse to change ignore me, and I accept that. There are others, of course, who have open minds, and uh, they always want to know more. And of course, there is another group who actually get it, and they embrace the message with vigor. And I've got to tell you, these numbers are growing so rapidly. This is going to happen. I often say that animal rights is the greatest social justice issue since the abolition of slavery. But it's not just about animal rights. It's also about human wrongs. Mm. So I think we're on, I'm pretty certain, we're on the right side of history mm. and will be proven correct. Mm. And it's interesting, in the corporate world, we're seeing people like even Bill Gates investing in Beyond Meat, uh, vegan alternatives. I'm curious, what, what influence do you feel that you have on uh, business people? Because you're not the stereotypical what people would class as an animal rights activist. You're very well dressed, you're a very distinguished gentleman, and they can't easily dismiss you. Plus you've got the history of the being, you know, even though it was 30 years ago, the former vice president of Citibank, it gives you such kind of credibility. So I'm curious, do you feel that you have, <clears throat> or how much influence do you think you have on other uh, executives and business people? Well, I can't take any credit for myself. It's People who are running organizations aren't there because they're pretty. They're there because they're smart. And I've got something in my, an arrow, if you like, in my quiver, and that's truth. So once you present them with the truth, they are all ears because they are intelligent. Um, I'm not saying this is true of everybody, but they are inter intelligent, capable people who given the right circumstances, would change. So I can point to some examples of uh, people who've made a decision after me meeting them or giving a speech that have decided to make all their factory canteens vegetarian. And we're talking about um, the multiplier effect. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of people who are getting meat off their menu, at least during the day, while during working hours. And uh, once you get off the meat and dairy drug, there's no going back. Mm -hmm. Your health improves, uh, the way in which you look at life improves, your relationships improve, and um, they never go back to the bad old days. In terms of um, ethics and business, a lot of corporations, uh, they think, okay, being, ethics, uh, being ethical, it's sort of fluffy um, or it's part of our corporate social responsibility, but they, they don't really link it to the bottom line. So what are your views on how ethics can really make a difference, a positive difference to an organization's bottom line? It really depends, and we have to be very clear about this, on how we define the bottom line. If you don't account for all the externalities in your P&L account, in your profit and loss account, you're really passing on to others all the costs of running your business. And you're passing it on to unwittingly people who are paying for your profits. So what do you call somebody who passes on his costs to someone else without them knowing? It's a pretty disparaging word. So that's what you're doing. 
if you're not picking up the tab for all the externalities like poisoning the environment or things like that, uh, and you're passing it on to someone else or to another generation, that is a form of theft. That ought to be a crime. And what about all the other stakeholders? For example, if your product demonstrably makes your customers sick or blows out the national health budget and kills people prematurely, what kind of person would dare to disclaim any responsibility for that product? What kind of person would do that? I think Upton Sinclair got it right. He said it's impossible to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on him not understanding it. Mm -hmm. So I say that in order to protect your market, you need to protect your customers. And let's face it, lifestyle diseases caused by the meat, dairy and the tobacco industries have already bankrupted the United States. They would need $8 trillion invested in treasury bills just to pay the interest. And they've got precisely zero. They could shut down every school, university, army, navy, air force, marines, homeland security, FBI and CIA, and they still will not have enough free cash flow to service their long-term Medicare debt can't be done. Now, if we didn't have to spend so much money on our medical bills, just think of how much money the governments would be able to save and we wouldn't have to be taxed so highly. Now that filters down to another kind of bottom line, profit after tax. And let's also face it that, as the, the, the FAO has said and the World Health Organization has said, and CSIRO has said, livestock is destroying our environment. Livestock creates more greenhouse gas emissions than all of transport put together. Cars, trains, buses, ships, lorries, the lot. So if we got livestock out of the equation, bearing in mind that the livestock industry is responsible for costing us more than twice as much as the recent global financial crisis, and it happens every year, and we don't even notice it, if we could get that terrible externality cost out of the equation, what a wonderful difference it would make to our economies, our health, our environment. These are very simple concepts, but they're very hard to bring, put into practice because in every industry there are massive barriers to entry. But those barriers to entry are just as high as exit barriers. Once you're in the industry, it's very hard to get out. It takes a paradigm shift in the mental attitude and the courage of the owners and the executives and the employees. And that's the challenge, I think, that the corporate world faces in the future. Absolutely, which leads on to that, my next question, which is around communication. How does one communicate these issues effectively if you are working within an organisation? Um, how do you integrate those ethics or those ethical ideas while still delivering on the things that you are accountable for in your role? That's a very good question. Uh, communication is key. That's something that human beings don't do very well. Um, my initial thought was, um, first of all, be gentle, um, because everyone's on a journey. Um, be polite in the way in which you communicate the truth and the facts, and be non non-judgmental. It's, it's a hard one. Isn't it's, it? a, it's a very hard <laughs> one, particularly when we people like like us who have actually seen yeah. the horror of, for example, the live animal export industry, where our animals have their eyes stabbed out and their tendons slashed. It's very hard for us to to be calm and balanced, but we need to we owe it to everyone to do our very best to behave graciously. Um, I would ask every employee in every organization. Tell me, would you bring your child to work on a work experience program and let them witness every decision you made? Openly, honestly, transparently. Every single decision. Knowing that everything you did, they would mimic in the future. How would you feel about that? And then I would actually ask every chairman, every, every CEO, what kinds of policies and practices would you establish inside your organization if you had your name on the building? What would you do? 
Then I would also ask, how would you respond if I showed you a guaranteed way, absolutely guaranteed, to make sure that your name was never, ever mentioned on the front page of a newspaper alongside the word fraud, abuse, negligence, crime, cruelty? I could show you a way to make sure that would never happen. What would you say to me? And I'd also ask, if you could inoculate your company from ever having this disgrace, inoculate yourself from ever having your name or your family's name besmirched on the front page of a newspaper, if you could make sure that your company always had that quality, would that increase or decrease your company's P multiple, your price and lease multiple, the value of your stock on the stock exchange? Just answer, would it go up or down? Now look at it another way. Let's say the whole market now knows that your company would never ever be disgraced in such a way on the front page of a newspaper. You knew perfectly well there was no possibility that your company would ever be disgraced in such an egregious way. Do you think that would encourage more investors in your group or fewer? If you knew that, what do you think would happen with the price of your bonds or the cost of your bank debt or your weighted average cost of capital? Would that be priced higher or lower as a consequence of the market knowing the kind of ethical company you ran? Now let's assume you take it to the next stage. As a consequence of that, do you think your shares would trade ceteris paribus, all other things being equal, at a premium or a discount? Knowing that you ran a highly ethical, honorable organization. And to the next stage, further down the line, do you think you would attract more high-quality staff or fewer high-quality staff? The, the answers to those questions will tell me a lot about your company and will tell me a lot about you. So I'd say that ethics and profits are not mutually exclusive ideas. If we are rational, responsible, respectable people, we must see them as being two sides of the same coin. Ethics should be like breathing, behaving in a kind, gentle, intelligent, rational way, following, if you like, the golden rule. And it's not a biblical thing, you know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It, 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 that just doesn't go back to the New Testament, I think, of, of Jesus. It goes back to the Babylonian Jew, Hillel, 70 years BC. In fact, it goes back even further, as I recall. It goes back uh, 500 years BC to uh, the Analects of Confucius. And even if it wasn't written anywhere, in any dusty old book, I think it was inscribed on the human heart long before it was ever written down in print. So I think if we could make ethics and decent, compassionate behavior part of our everyday life, our daily uh, conversation, our discourse, in the way in which we ran our organizations, we'd be more profitable, we'd be more successful, and, to use that word that has been bandied around so much, we'd be more sustainable because then we would earn the right, if you like, to be sustainable. Mm. Until then, we don't have that right. Mm. That's a very powerful answer. And I think those really powerful questions as well, really important for, for organisations to, to, to ask, and I don't think they are. So thank you for sharing that. So just finally to wrap up then, Phil, recently we had a big media expose around the greyhound industry. And um, it was particularly around the issue of live baiting of small animals. Um, but I think you and I both know the greyhound industry. There's a lot more wrong with it as well, including the treatment of dogs. What happened was there was a big public outcry and a lot of sponsors pulled out. So I wonder if you could make some... What, what are your thoughts on businesses who sponsor these kind of things? Because a lot of these uh, events or industries are sponsored by corporations. What's your advice to a business who is already sponsoring or considering sponsoring events that involve animal cruelty? Having a company's brand 
associated with something as grubby as the greyhound industry is a travesty. Anyone who runs a company has plenty of wonderful opportunities to promote their brand by financing or sponsoring terrific organizations and sports. Women's netball, for example, the swimming, the cricket, athletics, um, sports that actually mean something, not that live off the back of the cruelty inflicted on these poor animals. I put up a lot of money to run a rescue program in Spain for the Galicos. These are Spanish greyhounds. And if I showed you the film footage of what I've seen in that industry, you would be absolutely shocked. And for anybody to say, and I know some high profile individuals have said this, that this live bait issue was done by a few rogue people. That is patently false. This is a cruel, disgusting, squalid industry. It has no place in civilized society, period. And the sooner it's, it's taken away and, and nobody supports it, the better. And passing a law is not going to do it. I think people, generally good people, of conscience, of intelligence, of compassion, should just stay away from it in droves. And if they did that, corporations wouldn't sponsor them at all. Mm. I think we just finally touch on the fact that what you're doing, you mentioned all these wonderful opportunities that corporations have got to do sponsorships. And of course, you do that with the Kindness Trust. Uh, and I know on your website, thekindnesstrust.com, there's several hundred projects that you've um, been involved with. Perhaps just to wrap up our interview, is there one or two that you would like to give examples of that you're working on at the moment? Let's give some inspiration to the corporates. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the most unusual ones was called Kindness House. It was a large building with 30 odd thousand square feet. And we brought in uh, about 300 very talented, smart young people from 40 odd NGOs. 85% of the people in the building paid no rent at all. Um, we had terrific organizations um, like Sea Shepherd, Greenpeace, the Wilderness Society, Lawyers for Animals, Social Firms, the Brotherhood of St. Lawrence, uh, Vegetarian Victoria. Uh, the list is endless. And the alumni of, of Kindness House have gone on to do great things. They came into the building, usually after working off a kitchen table, and many of them started off with one or two people. And when they left, they had 50, 60, 80, sometimes 100 people working for them. So like all good incubators, we took them in when they were small, gave them free accommodation, gave them some guidance, gave them money. And a few years later, they were very effective. Classic example would be beyond zero emissions. Look what they've accomplished here in Australia. So... Um, it's, it's incubating ideas like that. Um, we've got many other projects that we've supported, like the Kindness Kids program that uh, teaches children to um, get off the meat and dairy drug, uh, rescuing wild, uh, uh, rescuing animals uh, in, uh, in India from the dancing bear industry, for example, uh, funding projects in China for the, the moon bears through Animals Asia. I think we've funded about uh, 500 odd projects over the years and uh, the, the people who run them deserve all the credit and they deserve all the support that corporates could provide. And if the corporates who are supporting this, uh, this squalid greyhound racing industry really want to get some bang for their buck, all they've got to do is go to the website and pick a name. Um, I've done the due diligence. I've been to see most of the, the projects. All they've got to do is um, go there uh, to the site, log on, and get involved. And it doesn't have to be financial. Those organizations are always looking for guidance or volunteers or even a, um, a helping hand um, from time to time. There is there's no shortage of opportunities to help and, and help in a very tangible way. Absolutely. Thank you very much for all the wonderful work you're doing. And thank you so much for talking with us today, Philip. It's a pleasure. Thank, thank you. you.